The stock market landscape in 2020 and in 2021 has been very different than what we're normally used to, especially the boys of Wall Street. And there seems to be no end to the optimism, especially now that COVID-19 is kind of behind us. People are fed up with being at home and the economy just can't wait to open back up, if not already opening up, like in places in Florida. But my guest today thinks there are a combination of things that could be worrisome, especially in the medium term, for the stock market in 2021. You know, my predictions, I think that the market has been reflecting a state that is anomalous, um, that is unprecedented, and that is extremely uncertain. The prediction for a market crash remains, but it's muted by this understanding that the government has provided unlimited support. Uh, you use the expression, the calm before the storm. I, one of my favorite uh, axioms is there's three phases in life. Either you're headed into a storm, you're in a storm, or you just got out of a storm. And I definitely believe we're heading into a storm. Too. James McDonald is the founder and the chief executive officer of Hercules Investments LLC, which is a Los Angeles based registered investment advisor, and he's a fund manager. So I cannot wait to hear his opinion on what he sees. Is there going to be a stock market crash in 2021? Another stock market crash, if you may, and how we can prepare for it. Let's go say hi to James. crash kind of warning for 2021 back in December 2020. And I was wondering if the one that just happened was the one that you're mentioning, or you are kind of envisioning another crash happening for 2021. You know, my predictions, I think that the market has been reflecting a state that is anomalous, um, that is unprecedented. And that is extremely uncertain. We have experienced a pandemic in a way that our economy has never faced before. And the threat of the pandemic was twofold. Obviously the health implications, we've lost half a million lives and the risk of that ballooning was extremely high last year this time. And because of that risk, the health crisis aspect of it, the federal government came in and offered unprecedented support. And whereas we believe the impact to jobs, to debt, corporate debt, uh, and to revenues that businesses would take in in order to continue to grow and see their stock prices rising, you know, we certainly expected there to be uh, a massive market crash like what happened in March at some point after the recovery. And because of the deep, deep risk to our health, uh, the government threw away its playbook for monetary policy. It threw away its playbook for fiscal responsibility, and it threw away its playbook for uh, interest rate management. And so those combined, along with people receiving paychecks to replace lost income and wages, it propelled the market into a place it's never been before. And the rally the recovery of stocks then proceeded to follow gains and to push stocks higher than they were before the pandemic. And so if you look at this and say, okay, before the pandemic, before the first cases of Corona in the United States, the market was more overvalued than it had ever been in history. Stocks were higher than they'd ever been in history. There was a correction due, irrespective of, of a pandemic. Absolutely. Everybody was talking about it. Like we were absolutely due for a correction. The pandemic just was like the trigger. Yes. Anything else could have been that, but it kind of made it a little bit more intense, that correction. Yes, it was so intense. Uh, and then the ramifications for people not being able to go to work, people not being able to find employment, keep employment and to pay bills, it triggered this unprecedented stimulus uh, and paycheck protection program where people just started getting income from the government. If you could imagine a state where every citizen gets a paycheck from the government to do nothing, it's difficult to imagine. And so as overvalued as the market was before the pandemic, 
imagine now that the market is even higher than it was pre-pandemic with the interruption of businesses and many businesses, not all, but many businesses still being closed and travel being impacted and entertainment being impacted. You know, when was the last time we saw the NFL season or the baseball season or the soccer season or the basketball season suspended, right? We haven't seen that before ever, even in times of war. To imply that the market is more valuable now than it was before people couldn't go to work and businesses were closed, it's difficult to grasp. And so what is quite literally a health crisis uh, and an economic crisis. So there was an end in sight. And I think, you know, this concept of a reopening trade where things go back to normal is creating a backdrop of continued bullishness. But we do think that there is more risk in the market than there is upside. At some point, you know, markets have to stop going straight up. And they did, you know, the NASDAQ did have a correction. The Russell 2000 had a correction last week, but the Dow and the S&P 500 transports and utilities are still breaking out to all time highs. Yeah, so that exactly was what, because if you look at the markets right now, they're kind of going sideways. And I feel like the upward movement that we saw before was kind of pricing and the reopening of the economy and the vaccine being distributed. And now, well, the vaccine is being distributed, economy is opening back up. They did send out the stimulus check and they're basically keeping the interest rates low so that people invest. First of all, if you're not investing, your money is getting completely devalued. So you must invest. And because people are understanding that you should be investing, the stock price are going higher, but it has been kind of consolidating now. Consolidation is a good word to describe uh, in many markets. And, and you know, the stock market is an auction, right? And at any auction, the enthusiasm of the bidders is what drives prices. And there was so much money made in the recovery from last March and on through the election and then on through the vaccine announcements. There was so much money made that the sentiment, you know, the bidders in the market continued their desire and their thirst for gains. And so we had rotation. We had a rotation from technology, obviously, Tesla, Amazon. Google, Netflix, and all the usual suspects, they ran up so high that when the bubble burst, and it was just a small burst, it wasn't a big collapse, but there was a correction in the NASDAQ, that money simply moved to small caps. And then you saw the Russell 2000 reflected through the small cap lens explode upward. We had a 40% gain from the time of the election up until two weeks ago in the Russell that's not only without precedent, uh, but it's over 50% higher than any other point in history. And that's the energy of the bidders. That's the sentiment and the desire for gains. And then when the Russell bubble burst somewhat, we had a pullback of significance, the biggest pullback in the Russell since last June. Then the money went and found a new home. The money went to Dow components and the S&P and you know, communications and, and real estate and other areas. And we've seen this in commodities as well. The money is just chasing opportunity. And when that rotation peters out, you used the word consolidation. I think it's a really good way to describe, you know, an abatement of that enthusiasm. If there's some negative news that hits the market that turns the enthusiasm to pessimism, I think that will be the beginning of, of a significant market sell-off. So you definitely do think, even though right now we don't have any like we're not expecting something crazy to happen. It's not like we're in the real estate bubble or anything like that. This consolidation is basically the calm before the storm. I kind of like to think of it as, okay, I feel like we have some sort of a boring reopening of an economy, boring political system. And I feel like, I don't know, this consolidation could also kind of break up. Like there is no way for us, like how, who are we to say that there is going to be a negative trigger again, sure. unless there's a war happening. I mean, wars are actually normally good for the economy. So yeah. any predict, like what could yeah. be the trigger? Like we can't predict, but any right. insights? You use the expression, the calm before the storm. I, one of my favorite uh, axioms is there's three phases in life. Either you're headed into a storm, you're in a storm or you just got out of a storm. And I definitely believe we're heading into a storm to your point, but that storm is, is controlled, right? We have guardrails from the federal government. They can simply add more stimulus. They can increase the paychecks. They can provide relief. Like you don't have to pay your taxes on time or you don't have to pay taxes at all. Businesses can get loans, emergency. There are so many guardrails for catastrophe that there's a complacency and that complacency We've seen it. And in some cases, it's not complacency. It's saying, 
we're going to take on risk. And then there's a new element. There's been a massive upheaval of retail investment through different new platforms. We've seen individuals that have not been significant participants in the stock market before rush in to gamble small amounts to push stocks around. We've seen stocks behave in ways that have never happened before on the major indexes. And we've seen penny stocks go from pennies to dollars and back down and back up. But we've never seen that with publicly traded firms like AMC and GameStop, where they're real businesses and those stocks are presumably being manipulated uh, by the crowd. And so these dynamics matter. And it's an overall picture where, as you said, you know, there's a storm coming at some point, there's got to be a reconciliation of GDP growth and corporate profits and corporate debt and earnings. There is a gap that has been growing between real corporate profits, GDP, and stock market prices. And the gap is 50% wider than it's ever been. In all previous cases where this gap was widening, there was a major market crash imminent. And so we do expect there to be some reconciliation, but it may be muted. There's this irony. There's this paradox. The worst things get, the higher stocks go. And it's because as risk becomes substantial, the federal government offers more protection. We saw an incredible correlation of the rate of infections and deaths and hospitalizations. We saw this number rising precipitously towards the uh, November, December timeframe, October, November, December, as the rate of deaths increased, stock market prices increased. And the paradox is something that is very dubious. The worse things get, the more people assume the government will come in. And when the government writes a check for $1.4 trillion, so what, you know, if businesses are closing and so what if jobs are being lost because the money's being replaced from somewhere else and the stock market behavior that we've seen in the short term is without precedent. So it's important to understand that, you know, at some point things normalize. We look at a, a statistic called mean reversion often, you know, things usually go back to normal and we are in an extreme state of stock market valuations. We are in an extreme state of uncertainty from a health crisis standpoint. And we are in extreme state with 10-year treasury yields. We're in extreme state with interest rate prices and so many other factors. And if we believe, if we can all agree that things will eventually go back to normal, normalcy does require stock markets to come down precipitously. But also normalcy for stock market is to eventually just grow over a long period of time. And you mentioned something that I think could be one of the triggers that this time around things have been different. And it's because these apps, Robinhood, have been enabling a lot of people who would normally not invest, start investing while getting into GameStop, but then educating themselves. And now it's easier than ever for just a random Joe to start investing. And then people like me popping up, teaching people, telling them, hey, when the stock market drops, do you want to buy? So there is more to the stock market now, there are more people kind of contributing to the market sentiment than just the good old Wall Street people, because now it's Wall Street versus Robin Hood and people who are really, you know, investing for their children and learning to do this on their own and kind of playing around with the market sentiment. And if everybody in the market has this vision or view that, okay, when the markets drop, it goes back up, S&P 500 gains goes back up, what goes down must go back up and vice versa. And everybody buys the moment there is any kind of correction, like last time, like two weeks ago, it was a correction. All the retail traders were just buying, 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 buying. I was like, yay, sales. So that has become some sort of a norm. And like, how can we even measure normalcy anymore? Because it's different than before. It's right. not just Wall Street anymore. Well, it depends on the time frame that you study this. And you mentioned at the top of your comments, long-term tendencies for markets to recover. In that context, since March 2009 to last year this time, the bull market was unprecedented. We had 12 and a half years, uh, excuse me, 12 years of unabated growth. The second fastest growing market over that time period was post-World War II. 
We've never seen a bull market like that before. We've never seen stock prices grow for that long of a time and go that high. And so its interruption last year was expected. We didn't expect COVID, but that interruption was then followed by a recovery that was faster than any point in history. Any recession we've had has been multiple years. If we agree that we were in a recession last March, at least through stock market prices, our recession lasted about 45 days. And so how can that be that an entire economy recovers in less, than, less time than it takes to lose 10 pounds, right? It's very, very difficult to assess that recovery as being the real recovery. And so long-term averages still require us to come down. As it relates to the retail trader, we've seen this before. We've seen this with the introduction of online brokerages, right? In the past, you had to use your phone and you had to have more capital and the E-trades and Ameritrades of the world came in and provided low cost, easy access for trading. And we saw a ton of money come in the market, ton of new participants and a ton of unexperience in investing in. The dot-com crash was what the result was of all these people believing in stock market prices continuing to go higher no matter what. Unlike 1999 and 2000, we have businesses now with real earnings. Many tech companies now are doing fantastic in their stock prices. We'll use Tesla as an example. Tesla stock price rose up to its potential because it was a game changer, but it stopped going up and then came down. And we think that will ultimately happen with most of the names, but it'll happen when it happens. As you also said, you know, you've got great market views. I really like the way that you're able to verbalize the truth. When there's uncertainty, sometimes truth is an unknown, but we are headed into a storm and there is complacency and there are retail investors who haven't experienced you know, a big drop. When you comment that they're coming in and buying dips, there simply haven't been any dips for the last six months up until the last couple of weeks. And so we'll see what happens. I do think the usual suspects that kind of guide the broader market will come into play. We have Institute for Supply Management numbers later this week. We'll continue to use earnings as a guide. We'll continue to use GDP, personal spending, and all those economic factors that give us the temperature check or a pulse check of how economics are playing out. I've been traveling a lot, just anecdotally. I've been to Minneapolis, and Dallas, and Miami, and New York City, and Puerto Rico, and I observe the economies, and I observe how they're responding to COVID, and it's very uneven. Uh, when I was in Miami about a month ago, I noticed no one was wearing a mask and all the restaurants were open. And all the hotel lobbies were full of people. And I said, you'd think there was no COVID here. In New York City, it was a ghost town. I've never been uh, in Times Square and you could count the number of people there. Yeah. It was incredible the difference in how COVID is impacting local economies. And as we see the numbers rise now in Florida and consider the implications uh, of those behaviors of people, we have to recognize that the vaccine rollout and the efficacy of containing this pandemic is going to be uneven as well. And so with that unevenness, there's going to be pockets of strength and there's going to be pockets of weakness. I do think that this is exacerbated by a new political administration. The last political administration took on this subject a lot differently, you know, than the current one is. And so that'll be interesting. 2020 had so much stress. You know, we saw riots like we've never seen. We saw economic trouble like we've never seen. We saw economic recovery like we've never seen. And so all things must go back to normal at some point. I don't know if 2021 will be in it. We're already, you know, uh, a fourth through the way of the, the year. I do think that, you know, people are optimistic though. People are looking forward to going back outside and socializing and have done so. The stock market is going to do what it does over time, it's going to go up, it's going to go down, and we consider the medium term as being high risk. Very well said. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting outlook on the economy. And I kind of like the fact that you're a little bit more pessimistic because I was kind of getting bored with being optimistic. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was it. I was waiting for a bigger crash. And um, well, if I may insert something there, another one of my favorite lines is, Reality strikes and changes things overnight. 
And so at some point the music will stop and, you know, there will be no board and there's going to be a big reckoning. Let's prepare for that. And as you guys know, recessions, and you mentioned this too, recessions when the markets drop, the biggest wealth transfers happen and you will find for new markets. That could be the topic we could talk about in the next video. What do you see as, as the next market people are, are, could be moving to? And I know you have some insights on that. So James McDonald, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a privilege. You guys, if you like the video, please like it, share it with your friends, and let's prepare for the next storm that is coming our way. <laughs> I forgot to ask you. Oh my gosh, we asked this from all of our guests, and you're the first guest that I did not ask you to. Uh, we asked them to make a silly face. A silly face? Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, James. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one. You too.